This is the OTP, presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. Plan on paying less for the coverage you need with Farm Bureau Health Plans. Get a quote today at fbhp.com. With Amy Wells, I'm Mike Keith in the Bet MGM studio, and we are on our way to the NFL Combine in Indianapolis, Indiana. It starts tomorrow, Tuesday. And so we're going to give you a little preview of what some of the big topics are. First of all, welcome, and it's good to see you. I know you're excited to go to Indianapolis. Well, Mike, you know, tis the season. It is combine time. I am ready. I'm fired up. I can't wait to go. But we've got to stop for a minute because I want to do this preview, and I'm very excited about talking all things combine. Okay. But we have to talk about social media first. Okay. Um, I saw you post a picture at 10 Voice, if you're not following Mike Keith on Instagram. Please follow. (laughs) Please follow. (laughs) I saw you posted a picture of You and Jim Nance, couple questions related to that. One, where in the world were you where you're hanging out with Jim Nance, and what do you talk to him about? We were at a function for Pinnacle Financial Partners, and I was taking that opportunity to congratulate him on one of the great performances in sports broadcasting history in Super Bowl 58. And here's why. Okay. The bottom line is you're calling the Super Bowl. It's a big deal. Every play puts a pressure on you that you don't have in the regular season. It's the same way for announcers as it is for players or coaches. Every play can take your breath away. In the regular season, it's, it becomes very obvious what the big moments are. And they don't occur like every single instant. Something that happens in the first quarter, you don't jump up and down about in the regular season in most cases, unless it's just way off the level of spectacular. In the Super Bowl, it can be any play at any time. So you're in this hyper focus that is just phenomenal. And then you broadcast a game that has so many twists and turns. That Super Bowl had everything. You have longer commercial breaks, which from a broadcaster's standpoint upsets your routine. You have a a much longer halftime, which from a broadcaster's standpoint upsets your routine. And then guess what? The game ends up going over four hours. (laughs) The beauty of the NFL and why the NFL is so successful as a TV package is because the games are right at three hours. Yeah. And it's perfect. Other sports are starting to figure that out. Baseball has done that with the pitch clock. But the NFL has that down. Well, the Super Bowl is naturally going to be longer, Amy. I mean, you just understand with the halftime show and all of that. And then the game goes into overtime, second time ever. Crazy. And then it goes into another overtime. And also, you're playing with new rules in postseason overtime for the first time. Right. Jim Nance put on a master class of how you handle all of those things, keep the game in the road. He kept Tony Romo in the road. And I thought Tony did a nice job, but Tony's – Tony's all over the place. And so keeping him locked in is is something that Jim does well and that they do well together. But that's a challenge. And then working in Tracy Wolfson, who was excellent, working in Jay Feely, who was fantastic, working in the rules guy, working in this, working in that. He played point guard. He played shooting guard. He play, I mean, he played defense. I mean, if you look at, if you look at, I mean, he, he did everything. And yet he got it home. And then he does the post-game interviews. And he's got the whole Travis Kelsey thing with, <laughs> we, fight for, we yeah. fight for our right to party. It was one of the great sports broadcasting performances ever. Because of where we are, 123 million people was the average viewership at one point over 200 million people watched all of that pressure 
that different circumstance, those challenges, and I mean, he did it like it was nothing. And that's why Jim Nance is so great. And I, as somebody who loves what we do, who just loves the craft of what we do, and this is inside baseball, I'm sorry, but you ask what I said to him. Yeah, I, I said, all of this. It was a clinic. Yeah. And every young broadcaster and every old broadcaster should watch it back and see how he did it and say, I'll probably not ever be able to do that, but it was beautiful. And the fact that I had a chance to just tell him that to, to his face was a special thing for me because he is, he's an amazing person and he is an amazing talent in the world of broadcasting. You know, for him, it's probably not very often that he gets to have a conversation about that experience with another person who has had that experience. There are not very many people in the world who have had the opportunity to call, whether on TV or right, radio, right. a Super Bowl. Right. And you have. So you understand what that experience is like, some of the challenges that he's navigating. Of course, it's a different medium, but... It was probably very refreshing for him to be able to have a conversation with someone other than like, I've watched a lot of Super Bowls and you did all right. I mean, to be able to have a real in-depth conversation about the challenges or to have someone say those things who actually understands what you're up against when you're calling a game like that, I would bet that that was a pretty special conversation for him. Well, it was for me um, because I, I love the craft. I grew up around people who, who taught the craft in a certain way. And the thing about Jim, and, and what drives you crazy about Jim if you're another broadcaster, is he makes it look so easy. Yeah. And he's talking with you, and he's throwing out certain points, and they're just natural parts of the conversation. That's his gift. And yet, the technicals of what he does from a broadcasting standpoint are so good. The fundamentals are so good. The, the baseline of him is just so fantastic. I mean, it's almost like people talk about Eddie Van Halen, the late Eddie Van Halen playing the guitar, and that he would take his guitars and he would rebuild them and he would come up with different combinations of things that nobody had ever heard, different sounds, different styles, and yet... The fundamentals of him as a guitar player, like Chet Atkins, the fundamentals of those people as basic guitar players are otherworldly because they just do the regular things so well. Jim Nance does the regular things in an off-the-chart manner, and then the specialness of who he is as a person is, is phenomenal. And all of those greats have that this past week. We celebrated the 44th anniversary of the Miracle on Ice, which Al Michaels called. It was only the second hockey game Al Michaels had ever called in his life. Really? Only the second hockey game. Oh, I didn't know that. He's calling all of those Russian names perfectly, which in 1980 didn't happen. And then the greatest moment in the history of American sports, he hits it out of the park. I don't think it'll ever be matched. No. And so, you know, to think about the Miracle on Ice call from Al Michaels, who is, if not the greatest play-by-play -play announcer in history, he's right at the top. And then that we're two weeks off Jim Nance calling this Super Bowl, this amazing Super Bowl in such a way that as we were losing our breath in a four-hour game, he kept going and was right on point with everything. It was amazing. Phenomenal. And, you know, it, for him to live in Nashville and to occasionally have a chance to bump into him, it is uh, what a treat. And he's a special guy. Jim Nance is the guy that you see on TV. 100%. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's rare as well. That's, right. That's a very that, unique thing. His broadcast of Super Bowl 58 was a master class. And I don't know that everybody would understand that who hasn't ever sat behind a microphone before. But I just have such respect for what he does. And my wife and I were watching the game, and I said, Jim Nance is just killing this. It is just phenomenal. And then as they got into the last Kansas City drive, I said, this game is f over four hours long. 
Now, we did a game that was over seven hours long, but we had two long delays. Yeah, we had lots of pauses. He's doing a game, and, and that wasn't easy. I mean, we'll say that. But that, what he did was much harder, much harder. Because you're so tired, and I'll I'll wrap this up because we got to get onto the preview. <laughs> um, but he said he still hadn't fully recovered from it. Really? Because of the emotion. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, the emotion of it is different than anything you ever feel. And there were so many different ebbs and flows and ups and downs and high. I mean you're emotionally just within the game I've never had an experience in my life not just in sports or in broadcasting I've never had an experience in my life like how I felt the two hours after Super Bowl 34 really it I it was it was it was excruciating because we lost but it was also just it must be what it's like to climb one of the great mountains in the world. It must be what it's like to win the Indianapolis 500 or the Daytona 500. I mean, I, I can't describe, I can't even describe how it felt. Yeah. And for him to do that on such a level with everybody watching and everybody critiquing you and everybody, oh. Yeah. Phenomenal. Yeah. I would like to have that experience. We will. Yeah. We will. I'm looking forward to it. All right, let's preview the Combine, which starts tomorrow. It does. On the OTP. We will do that. Yes. And thank you for asking the question. Well, Mike, I like to... And I was a little proud of that picture, I'll have to admit. It was a great picture. You guys looked very happy. And I like to um, live vicariously through your celebrity encounters. (laughs) So thank you for that. Thank you. When you meet someone famous, we all win. Okay, so what we're going to do on the pre-Combine edition of the OTP is we are going to give you a primer, if you will. Mm, yes. Hit some of the high notes of what will happen. And it's not necessarily about this prospect or that prospect, although we will mention some. It's more about the topics that we will be hitting as we drop an OTP every day, counting today, for the next seven days. Yes, get and, ready. And then there will be OTP content that comes out of this combine that we will use probably throughout the course of the spring. Yeah. Because so many things happen. And as certain things become newsworthy, we'll say, oh, let's go back and play this interview. Or, I I mean, it is so newsworthy. So the the first part to me of this primer is the new. Four new general managers and eight new head coaches, including our own Titans' Brian Callahan. And Brian Callahan and Rand Carthon will be talking tomorrow, Tuesday morning. And then we will also have an OTP with them tomorrow. Yep. So subscribe, rate, and review, whatever it is you do. We, lo- <laughs> we love that if Clear you would do it. Clear some space on your and tell And tell your friends. Yeah. Retweet it, right? Sure. Retweet it. Or just listen. Just, or just download it to your or, phone. And that's the thing is there will be video, which is great if you'd like to watch it. But if you don't have the ability to watch it, then you can listen to it. Listen in your car. Listen while you're working out. While you're working out. There you go. If you're into that kind of thing. If you're into that. Okay. I think Antonio Pierce, the new head coach of the Las Vegas Raiders, will be the most quotable. Really? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can see that. And, you know, he interviewed for the Titans job, too, when he was just the – when he was the interim – and that the Raiders had not officially designated him. Uh, I know people were very impressed with him. And he says a lot of stuff like <laughs> like a player. Yeah, yeah. Well, remember, I mean, Antonio Pierce, the interesting thing about him, I mean, his favorite radio show was the Howard Stern Show. Yeah. He actually did a day internship at the Howard Stern Show at one point. Really? Answered the phones and everything. And, so, and he fit right in with that whole – fun crew of people who will say anything, anything yeah. and he will say anything. How do so you know this. I know a lot of stuff. Whoa. Whoa. That was a good little tidbit. Now I'm extra excited for that. Okay. Conference. So the new is part of the primer topic. The quarterbacks mm-hmm. always, right? Always quarterbacks. But let's face it. You've got to start with what does Chicago do with Justin Fields? I mean, so we're going to get a lot of talk about that there in, in Indianapolis starting tomorrow. Yeah. Probably starting tonight. Right. <laughs> um, what do they do with Justin Fields? They have the number one pick. They have the number nine pick. 
Uh, what Daniel Jeremiah has said, the, the NFL network analyst, is he has said, you got to trade him. Even though he has shown progress, even though he has made, certainly made strides, you have to trade him. And this is Daniel Jeremiah's logic, Amy. He says, okay, Fields is a good player. Now it's time to pay him. You will be able to get something back from him in the market. And then you can draft Caleb Williams, who is a better prospect, who is considered a sure thing, the quarterback out of USC. And you start with him on a rookie contract with the fifth-year option, just like Fields has. And you're able to better build the rest of your program because now you can trade back you can tra- you can take Williams at 1 and then you can take that ninth pick which you- was your original pick the one pick is Carolina's the ninth pick is yours and then you can maneuver around and do something maybe you can package uh-huh. Fields and the ninth pick to move up to 3 yeah and then end up with Marvin Harrison yeah. Jr. It, it's definitely very interesting um, from a business perspective. I mean, uh, conventionally just watching them play, you would say, eh, I mean, give the guy another shot. Right. He's sure. the, You've seen he's, him do well. Jeff like, Joniak, the, the voice of the Chicago Bears, told us last year in Indianapolis, he said, because there were all these rumors last year, he, right. said, he said, they're keeping him. Yeah. And then on March 12th, they made the trade with Carolina – to trade the number one pick, and Carolina went up and got Bryce Young, they said they're keeping him. He's one of the most popular athletes in Chicago, if not the most popular athlete. But a year later, and where they are, is this the chance to go to a completely different level? And Chicago closed the year. Matt Eberflus and the Bears closed on a nice run. They improved. Well, and that's the thing. When you see them continuing to make progress as a team, you think – why Why mess up a good thing? Right. You know, if it ain't broke, it seems like things are kind of going well. When you start to break down the numbers like Daniel Jeremiah did, you start to see that there may be a, a to steal a phrase that we at the Titans have used before, a good to great thing mm-hmm. where you have the opportunity to take something that's making some incremental improvements. Do you make a really big shakeup from a financial standpoint that makes so much sense for your club? And also gives you the ability to bring someone in who might take you back a step in right. terms of teaching him and, you know, getting a rookie up to speed with the National Football League. But then can he take leaps in year two and three and all of a sudden you're in a different echelon. So it, it'll be interesting to see what their front office does and the moves that they make. You know, the Coach Mackism, there are there's the quarterback draft and then there's everybody else. What they end up doing is going to shift the entire – just realm of consideration for the rest of the team. You have set me up well for the next few points, but which are all of, thank you so much, <laughs> all of the talk about Kirk Cousins, Russell Wilson, where do they end up? Yeah. Tampa Bay looks like it is going to re-sign Baker Mayfield. We'll see. Where does Ryan Tannehill go? And if Washington drafts a quarterback, what do they do with Sam Howell? Yeah. Because let me tell you something, Sam Howell is a real prospect. Mm-hmm. He was a fifth-round pick, and he has become a really, really nice player. I could see a scenario where Washington decides to hold on to him, and yet they too may be in a situation where they feel like they could go from good to great by drafting Drake May or Jaden Daniels and elevate themselves and get something nice for Sam Howell. Well, uh, yeah, and there's just so many uh, there's so many scenarios with that one specifically because you're right. Sam Howell's a really good, he's a nice player. He's a good prospect. He's a guy that just needs to find the right situation. He needs, I really wanted him. He needs to find his spot. He yeah. needs a home. Yeah, and uh, it, where he doesn't get sacked 147 times. Yeah, and that's that would really help him out. I yes, think. I that think has he'd to enjoy hurt. that. Yes. Yeah. So I've come up with 13 teams who potentially want or need a quarterback. Oh, this is a good list. And may not be. We'll see. But <laughs> but you can see the scenarios. Atlanta, Chicago, Denver, Las Vegas, Minnesota, if you know they Kirk, yeah. even if they bring Kirk Cousins back, maybe they want to go ahead and get that guy. New England, New Orleans, Derek Carr back, but do they want to go in a different direction? What do the Giants do? 
What do the Jets do with the thought process that Aaron Rodgers doesn't play forever, if at all? Are we going to talk about Aaron Rodgers again this offseason? Is this going to be a thing? I sure. can't do Rodgers watch for three years in a row. I know. Ooh. Pittsburgh, <laughs> are they sold on Kenny Pickett? What do they do? Seattle's committed to Geno Smith seemingly for now, but are they committed forever? Tampa Bay, again, we think Baker Mayfield goes back there, but eh. yeah. and then Washington. So I got 13 teams. I went through and I, and I started off with – with less, and then I went back and I said, well, if... But but again, I, I mean, that's one of the intriguing parts about all of this. Well, and there's a lot of teams here who have who have someone. It, there aren't too many teams that just have a vacancy, right. essentially. There are teams that have someone and have a, a pretty decent someone. Right. Um, but do you want to bring in the next guy behind them, like in a Derek Carr situation, in a... Kirk Cousins maybe situation do you want to have the next guy right. in place and then that shakes up the whole draft because all of a sudden you're bringing in a quarterback when no one thought you were bringing in a quarterback and you've blown up five other boards well I think we when we return from Indianapolis we'll have a better idea about some of these teams yes because you start to hear the rumors and things start to crystallize and get real because GMs and coaches, but mostly GMs, start to drop hints. Yes, and they start – they're all in one concentrated place. The conversations start to right. to bubble a little bit. So Caleb Williams, Drake May, and Jaden Daniels are thought to be the top three quarterbacks. Who's number four? J.J. McCarthy, Bo Nix, Michael Penix. That'll be something we'll be interested to watch in Indianapolis. And – Part of this is what do Michael Penix's medicals look like? And medicals for a lot of guys. Yeah. One of the biggest keys to the combine, as you know, is the medical availability that the NFL and teams are afforded there because Indianapolis has such great medical facilities and they're so close to Lucas Oil Stadium. They're so close to Lucas Oil. They're able to get so many things on site as well. If you go down to where they're doing the medical evaluations, it kind of looks like a hospital. It does. <laughs> they, it, it really just looks like... I ended like, up down there by accident once. Yeah. I took the wrong elevator. Uh-huh. It's wild. Yeah, they gave me an EKG. Yeah, well, you know, mm -hmm. it's good. I'm glad you checked out. I You're did. You're still here. <laughs> no, it really is. There's a whole region of Lucas Oil that is just blocked off for medical evaluations, and it looks like a medical treatment facility. They are set up for that, and it's because that information is the most valuable thing. You want to see a guy run fast and jump high, and that's lovely and delightful, but you also want to see that like his limbs are intact <laughs> and his everything that he may have injured in a whole in his whole life. You're getting the Carfax report on that. When you he's are, done. And, and teams will end up red flagging guys because of what they see, and then some teams won't. Yeah. I mean, some teams will say, I mean, Tajay Spears. You know, I would imagine some teams said, mm, and, but the Titans felt good about Tajay Spears' situation through their – because people have different standards of medical evaluations. And they, and they say, well, okay, are we looking at a guy for 15 years? Or are we looking at a guy for five years? Or, you know, everybody has a different take. The doctors have different takes. Your own doctors have the ability to be involved. But to get that in one centralized place, the medicals, that's how the combine started. Yep, yep. That's That was the genesis of it all. And it's still the most useful part to coaches and scouting staffs. All right, so a lot on quarterbacks there. Yes. Obviously on coaches. More to come after a quick break for our friends from SeatGeek, the new official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. When you're buying or selling tickets to Titans games or any live event in Nashville, SeatGeek is the place to do it. SeatGeek, the new official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. So, Titans fans can fan. I had a mouthful of coffee. Pregnant pause. <laughs> but we sorry. Got, but we got I had it to in. swallow my coffee. That's okay. All right. 70 offensive linemen invited to the combine. One of the things to watch how many of those offensive tackles are projected to go in round one after the combine happens? Could it be seven offensive tackles, which would match the all-time high from 2008? 
It's a really good year. And Titans fans are going, yes. Yay. Yay. <laughs> but, but here's the thing about this, too. If there are so many offensive tackles that are rated to go in the first round, then wouldn't there be an offensive tackle who would be really good at number 38, potentially? Doesn't that, if you're the Titans, doesn't that open your option to say, maybe we take that guy with that high pick in round two? Yeah, it definitely is a possibility. Coach Mack and Rhett Bryan last week on the OTP, if y'all listened, um, talked a lot about this class well, they disagree of offensive about it, linemen. Right? They had some disagreements about it and about who was really the top guy. That was their issue. There, there's about three or four who are like elite, elite, and that's where we had some some discussion. But if you have an O line coach who's incredible, like Bill Callahan, yeah, and his assistant is Scott Fuchs, who's only a 30 year veteran O line coach yeah. who comes in from Kansas to join Bill Callahan. Do you do you not think, well, maybe we could do something different at seven and take an offensive lineman in the second round and coach him up? I I think these the numbers of quality offensive linemen actually give the Titans options. Oh, absolutely. I think you're one hundred percent correct. I think that the coaching aspect of it is a very interesting part that I never thought about. I didn't think about the... Rhett, Rhett thinks the Titans definitely need... It. This is what he said. I, I've heard. Coach Mack thinks you'll be able to get somebody later who's very good, and he has total confidence in the coaching staff. Rhett thinks you take the pick at seven in, as an offensive lineman and be done with it. Right. We will certainly discuss that more, and we'll probably taunt them and pull it out of them, get them to argue. I uh, love that. Uh, yeah, it's good. Yeah. Uh, on the OTP later this week in Indianapolis. Running back talk... Lots of it. Derrick Henry. Mm-hmm. Saquon Barkley. Yes. Josh Jacobs. Tony Pollard. Austin Eckler. All of those guys are interesting potential free agents. Yeah. Free agency doesn't start until March 13th. Nope. We've got time. But the thing that really makes their positions more interesting is there is no feature back in this draft like B. John Robinson was last year. Mm-mm. There, as a matter of fact... There's no back in this draft who figures to go in the top 25. Maybe it could be that a back doesn't go until after 50. And then a bunch could happen at once. Yeah. But who's the number one running back? I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see. And I think that this position group, more than maybe any other, except for maybe quarterback, is going to be the most deeply impacted by free agency. Because I think if you've got a spot and you need somebody, where are you going to look? Maybe it's free agency when in previous years you get somebody in the draft because they're cheaper. Right. With this draft class of people, that idea might shift a little right. bit. And that could have a big impact. It's, it's going to be an interesting year in running back world. If you need help for 2024. Where are you going to go? Right. Right. Because it's, it's a little different year. Yeah. Uh, I think. As we go to wide receiver, and everybody loves wide receivers and corners are always the most fascinating part to me of the combine. They're the most fun to watch work out. Well, because what they do looks more, to me, looks more like football. Yeah. For I, them. Because they're like actually interacting with a football? They interact with a football, but the other thing too is they run and they cut and they jump, and that's what they actually do in the games. Yeah. I, I could give a flip how high an offensive guard verticals. You don't want to watch the big guys I, jump? Again. For, My. I mean, you're just sort of. Is it not the best part of the combine? But, Amy, your whole thing is you you like, I mean, you love Ripley's Believe It or Not and no, stuff like that. You're I don't. that You're that person. You watch stupid pet tricks, <laughs> stupid human tricks. No, That's your. That's your thing. I like I'm more. I'm about functionality and football, and you're about <laughs> goofery in no, some ways when it comes to the. Well, it's true. I want to see a giant but human lift themselves off the ground Amy, and arrive safely back at Earth. I think that Amy, is the most athletic thing a human. Can I would do. rather see how long their arms are and how quick they are in certain mm. drills, and but. No. Nope. For the wide receivers Jump. and for the corners and maybe even the safeties as the game goes today, 
it's a lot more all of those things the measurables seem to translate more than most positions yes I would agree with that the workouts that they are doing more accurately simulate what you're going to see on Sunday yes offensive linemen typically but you don't like jump. To, but you like to watch them jump because you think it's funny I don't think it's funny yeah. I think it's incredible okay it's amazing all right, all right. it's athleticism well, at its finest I mean with some of them it is athleticism at its finest and yeah. with some of them it's just not very it pretty. with some of them it's really bad well you like that God love admit you. it <laughs> I will never okay I will never Marvin Harrison is the number one wide receiver he is mm-hmm. wide receiver one yes I think he's the best player in the draft yeah. regardless of position regard I mean if you were picking number one based on that he's number one but who's the number two wide receiver Malik Neighbors, LSU, Romeo Dunsey, Washington, or I give you another option, which I think is really intriguing, and I think is going to be one of the stories of the combine as you not only watch the workouts, but listen to the whispers. Is wide receiver two actually Georgia tight end Brock Bowers? It's interesting. It is interesting because Brock Bowers is such a phenomenal tight end prospect with athleticism that is so unusual. I just saw a clip this morning before I came in here of Georgia handing him the ball in a game against Vanderbilt earlier in his career and him running a sweep. Amy, he looks like a running back with the ball. I mean, it's so natural and he's got shake and he's he uses his size well and if you've, if you've watched him play against really good teams, against really good competition, I mean, he's such a difference maker. And does somebody just say, that's something that changes us dramatically, even more so than one of the receivers? And they're a bunch of good ones. Yeah. But does he become that second pass catcher, better said, who is taken – because he is just such a weapon. I think it's really possible that there is a team that sees him on the board and goes, I mean, we've got to have that. I mean, throw out all of our needs and everything else. Mm -hmm. We need that human because his skill set is so outside the realm of what everybody else on the field can do. Um, We need that in our lives. So I think that there is definitely a possibility that he goes higher than – any other tight end would because of what he's able to do. But he may go higher than anybody thinks because somebody covets the fact that he is so unusual in terms of his skill set. I think you're 100% right. I mean, he is not just another pass-catching tight end, but he's devastating on third down. He's devastating in the red zone. He will block. Because of his athleticism, you can line him up anywhere. I mean, in in some ways, he's almost the tight end dream of an offensive coordinator in today's game because he can stay on the field in every situation. You can use him in every way, and you can take other pieces because so many teams like to play two and three tight ends. You can take Brock Bowers, and you can put other players with him who fit in different ways. And and that's the great thing because suddenly it improves your tight end core in such a way that you're you're able to have more flexibility roster-wise too. Yeah, he's a person that as soon as he steps on the field, a defense has to acknowledge him and plan for it. He, you just have to. So then what can you do with all of the other pieces because this defense has to do something with him. Let's play a little game. I love a game. And you're, and you're going to get to quiz me. Okay. All right. The four teams who were in the conference championship games, would you mind throwing them out one by one, please? Detroit. Great rookie tight end who was a difference maker. Okay. Keep going. San Francisco. Hall of Fame tight end who was the best in the game this year. Kansas City. Hall of Fame tight end who basically helped Patrick Mahomes win the Super Bowl for them. Baltimore. Baltimore, Mark Andrews, perennial Pro Bowl tight end, who has been the best friend 
of Lamar Jackson throughout his career. He's been the one constant. It's very interesting, so Mike. Wh- what do they all have? They have a tight end. They all have devastating tight ends. They have playmakers. They have game changers at that position. They have quarterbacks' best friends at that position. Wow. Can you tell I love Brock Bowers? Mike, that was a really good little Thank you. Little, little point. Little you demonstration. Just made. That was pretty solid. All right. Wow. Other Indianapolis. This has been fun, right? This are you has ha- been are you having fun. a good Mike, time? What time a is it now? Bit of a moment. We've got to get in the we've got to get in the car soon. We haven't done this much. We haven't. It feels good. It really does. Yeah. Who comes out of Indianapolis as the top projected edge rusher? Does someone do a Trayvon Walker performance where they go? How can what? we not draft World? it? What is that? Mm-hmm. He's 6'4", 275, and he runs like a wide receiver, and he does do the vertical like he's a basketball player and the three cones like. It happens every year. It happen- yeah, but, but is it an edge rusher? And, uh, and these, these are like corners. Yeah. You can't get enough of them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you it, listen, it will sound crazy, but if the Titans filled enough needs – throughout the course of free agency that they got there and they had an edge rusher rated the highest on their board at seven. You always take him. I, I mean, you, you just always take You him. can't get enough of them Mm-mm. because nope. look at what's happened when they've had injuries over the last few years. And the thing is, drafting them is so smart because once you have to pay them in free agency, whether it's your own guy or somebody else's guy, you overpay. Yeah. yeah. Because, I mean, it's an integral part of, of, of every team. It's just like I can give you the final four again in the NFL, and they have a devastating mm-hmm. tight end, but all of them have more than one edge rusher who can do it. It's why San Francisco traded for Chase Young. Yeah. is And he didn't play that great in a regular season, but then in the Super Bowl, particularly in the first half, he was a dominant player. Well, and it, just in every conversation we've heard about what this Tennessee Titans defense is going to look like. Right. The more edge rushers you can have who can be quick and violent and aggressive, the better you I, I don't think are. that happens. You know, I don't think that's what they do. But you can see it. But you always have to keep it in mind, which is why it's, it's such a position of focus for all 32 NFL teams. So we mentioned, does somebody put on a combine performance that's through the roof? Uh Leatu Latu from UCLA was great at the Senior Bowl. How do his medicals look? Uh, is Alabama's Dallas Turner the man? The guy I'm most interested to see, Florida State's Jared Verse, who came from Albany and was the biggest transfer in the portal two years ago, goes to Florida State and just shows out. I want to see him. Does Jared Verse put himself in another universe? Uh, you like that? Oh, Mike, that. That's enough for that okay. one, I think. <laughs> Who builds the case to take their current projection as a second-round pick to a first-round pick? Is it some of the interior offensive linemen? Is it some of the wide receivers who right now are being men- mentioned as second-round picks? They leave Indianapolis a projected first-round pick. That's always fascinating because there's always somebody you're thinking – I mean, like uh, Kool-Aid McKinstry mm-hmm. from Alabama who was mentioned as a top-ten pick – now, for whatever reason, his status has fallen, and does he put himself back in the discussion as a as the top corner that would be picked, or at least a first round pick? Those are the things that are the most interesting to watch as the week goes on, and it, you know they go through processes that we can't see, where they're doing the interviews. Obviously, there's the medicals, there's the weigh in. All of these pieces start to fall into place, and you see guys making money, and you see guys losing money, and it happens every year. All the boards, you can almost see it happening in real time. People moving up and moving down. Right. And that's just how the combine works. And so it's going to be interesting to see as we get people in interviews with coaches, in meeting rooms, and on be able to get on the board with different coaches. And then obviously the, those medicals again. Once all of those pieces start to come together, we're going to see some things start to move up and down. What players get the franchise tag? That sometimes happens at the Combine, which is interesting. And then, finally, will players take the cognitive tests? Their agents are telling them not to. Which is very interesting. After what we saw with... C.J. Stroud. Yeah, people... People saying that he didn't perform very well, and that became a big topic of conversation. I can see why an agent would be like, "Don't even touch it. Don't, mm-mm, don't do it." I, I, 
I don't know how I feel about it. I think it's kind of a fun little thing, but I don't think it's a – I don't think it's a deciding factor. It, I mean, look at C.J. Stroud. Is it a deciding factor? Have you ever heard somebody say, didn't do great on the cognitive test, cut him? Yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, then, yeah. If I'm an agent, I'd tell I mean, him it was certainly it. a big, a big uh, red flag with Vince Young. Interesting. And then there was a dispute over – you know, whether the test had been administered properly or whether he had understood, you know, exactly what the what the rules and so forth were. And, and there was a big controversy with it. And obviously huh. there have been controversies at different times over the years with guys who um, maybe don't understand. Because there are different tests. It's like when you take the SAT or the ACT. There's different rules. There are different strategies. Yeah. On yeah. one you guess, on the other you don't. Mm-hmm. And there are strategies with the cognitive tests as well, according to how they're prepared for these tests. Yep. And do they do they get that wrong? And then do you ask the question, well, if you don't understand the directions, is that, is anoth- that, is that yeah. another thing? So are they just better off? Because then they also don't have to spend that time preparing for the cognitive tests as part of their preparation for the combine. Right. I mean, it frees them up to run a little faster. Jump higher. Jump higher. Can you imagine a world, though, where Ryan Fitzpatrick did not take the cognitive test? I mean, think of what would we talk about about him. He made 49. He did a great job, and it his came fellow, up a lot. His fellow Harvard man, Pat McAnally, who ended up being the punter for Cincinnati, made 50. Yeah. Made 50 out of 50. Yeah. But I that mean, was the wonder. Like, now other tests are used. Yeah, these are different. But it's the same kind of standardized testing. If you thing. were a prospect, would you take it? I think if I were advising myself, if I was not the prospect, okay, if, you were if, an I agent. Was, if I was an agent, I would say don't take it. If it was me, myself, I'm a rule follower. <laughs> By nature. And I think if someone told me to take it, I'd take it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. When did you become a rule follower? Well, I mean, I've been here a long time. I kind of skirt the rules now. Well, as long as you have your own rules. Originally, I was a rule follower. (laughs) Yeah, I wouldn't want anybody to be mad. It's a job interview. I'm going to do whatever they ask me to do. I think I would take it according to what position I play. Yeah. If it was something that mattered specifically to the position... I would probably do it. There are some I was an okay test taker. I can't say, you know, because people yeah. say, I'm a bad test taker. And, yeah. you know, generally those were the people who didn't study. Right. Um, that's why you're bad. Yeah, that's why you're. <laughs> you that's, didn't study that's for That's the why test. you're bad. 90% of the quote unquote bad test takers <laughs> <laughs> didn't study. Didn't go to class. Yeah. Well, it, yeah, ding, ding. Uh, but there are some people clearly who do take tests better than others. I was okay. I mean, I, you know, it wasn't my favorite thing to do, but it didn't horrify me to the point that I froze. And that I had a friend that that did happen. He yeah. would study and everything, but he would freeze because he would get so nervous. Yeah. I think but it is depends that also something you don't want. I, that's the thing about this time of year. Isn't it fun though? Is everything is a thing. Everything's a thing. Yeah. Just like all this. So that's what, that's why we're going to the combine. I love it. Because everything is a thing. Everything's a thing. Where people go to eat at night and what happens in the medicals and what we're going to hear about all the quarterbacks. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Can this be our tagline? It's the most wonderful time of the no. year. No. 2020. NFL combine where everything's a thing. Where everything's a thing. Isn't oh, it nice? Or 2024 NFL combine. The most wonderful time of the year. Yeah, but that's taken by Christmas. Well, okay. <laughs> but but here's the thing. That's why we're going to do an OTP every single day. Yes. And tomorrow, it'll be the head coach and the general manager. And Wednesday, we'll be talking about draft. And Thursday, Coach Mac will be on. And Friday, Coach Mac will be on. Where it's going to be a, a it, full Mac attack. It's a Macapalooza. Yeah. So, we're, I mean, it is going to be so much fun. So, please, subscribe to the OTP. Uh, anywhere you get your podcast. If this is your first week coming to us or if you're new to us, this is the time where we get to do a lot of fun stuff. We love doing these shows. We love not sleeping. We love being there in all the hoopla, knee deep in the hoopla.
Titans draft coverage, knee deep in the hoopla. Stor- stolen that from starships, we built this city. <laughs> Big hit in the mid '80s, um, before some people were born. Yeah. Anyway, um, it really is fantastic, and we're excited to bring it to you. We appreciate all the people, the OT people. We want more OT people, and uh, let's make it happen. Let's let's get to Indianapolis. Are you ready to go? I'm ready to go. Let's do it. For Amy Wells, I'm Mike Keith, thanking you for joining us for the pre-combine edition of the OTP. Titans draft coverage, where everything's a thing. It's the most wonderful time of the year. We're going to workshop this. Welcome to the big show, where the legends go. Everybody knows it's our high.